Father, we thank you for your great love. God, I ask that you would open your word to us today that we may rejoice in you because knowing you is worth the effort of seeking you. God, we love you. Be here, be glorified. It's through your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, Psalm 34, here we go. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. For to those who fear him, there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. I put a little note beside my verse on that and says, it is God alone that is good. And those who seek him shall never want him, right? We will always have him. In, his, in our presence. Come, verse 11, come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear the Lord, who is the man who desires life and loves his lengths of days that he may see good. Well, then keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Amen? All right. Psalm 34, the thing we're going to look at today, knowing God is worth the effort. The main point I want you to see is this, that a vigorous pursuit of God guarantees blessing. Listen, a vigorous pursuit of God guarantees our blessing. And there are so many people, like me sometimes, that struggle with saying doing something guarantees God does something. We just feel like maybe it's manipulating God or we take the sovereignty of God away or his authority away. But we don't do that when God says, look, you seek me, you'll find me. God put himself on the line and we're quoting him on this one. If you seek after the Lord, you will experience the blessing of Jesus Christ. That's the main point, so let's support that. This first three verses is the decision and the call to worship. David says, let me just... I will bless the Lord at all times. There's the decision. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord, and let the humble hear and be glad. Listen, here's the call. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt His name together. There are three aspects of worship I want you to remember. This year we're going to focus, on 2019, we're going to focus upon the year of praise. So I'm going to keep zeroing in on praise. We're going to preach through the book of Romans until maybe the Lord returns. I have no idea how long it's going to take us to finish the book of Romans. On January 1st, not the 1st, but whatever first Sunday is in January, we're going to start the book of Romans. So I'm going to try to do two themes at the same time. The one, we're going to unpack the book of Romans verse by verse. The second theme, we're going to push to praise God for everything we see about him. This year, we want to see, savor, and magnify the Lord together. So I want to invite you into that process right now. There are three aspects to worship the Lord. Number one, a will to praise God. You can't get around this. I heard Johnny Hunt pray this a couple weeks ago. He said, God, give me the will to will. I love that prayer. Give me the will to to will. And what he's saying is, I want to will after you. So if you're going to praise the Lord, there's no lackadaisical effort in this. You just can't sit on your hands and think it's going to accidentally happen. You must determine, I will bless the Lord, is what David says. Determine to praise the Lord. Number two, there must be a boast about God. If you're going to will to praise the Lord, well, praising the Lord means boasting about God. So we're not boasting about the Lord. We're not praising the Lord. We're praising something else. 
Too many people are confused about this. We think that praise is just talking about ourselves. A testimony always directs towards the Lord, not towards other things. We use the situation of our lives to point people to the Lord. But if we make an overt will or declaration that I'm going to praise the Lord, then you must boast about the Lord. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Number three, the third aspect of worship, or a call to worship in this case, is an invitation for others to participate. New Hope, I am inviting you in for the next 12 months, but really all of your life, that we have it together, to praise the Lord, not ourselves. Not what we're doing, not what we think we're doing right. No, 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 no. Our focus must never be on ourselves. Instead, we give an invite to other people to join us as we look and boast upon the Lord. So let's take a few minutes and do that together from this psalm. David has just invited us into boasting and praising God. Y'all want to? I do. Let's do it. Here we go. What the Lord did when David sought him. Verses 4 through 7 here is going to be David's boast. This is what God did. So let's take a look at the passage. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from my fears. And those who look to him are radiant. So far we got an answer, we got deliverance, we got radiant. And their faces will never be ashamed. He secures us so that we're not shamed. Right now this is, I'm tangenting here. I don't really have the time to do it, but, but here we go. Right now, in Christianity, in American Christianity, we are so afraid of being shamed for what we believe in that I'm not so sure this verse applies to us. Or is, no, it always applies to us. Is descriptive of us. I think too often we hide our Jesus in the closet and don't bring him out unless we think we can get something from him or by using his name. I was watching a movie. I don't know how good it is. I haven't finished it yet. Still got like two hours left. I'm an hour and a half into it by Martin Scorsese, or whatever his name is. Uh, It's about some missionaries going to uh, Japan, Jesuit Catholic missionaries who went to Japan. These are the last two they sent in, and they are struggling. And the church over there was being, it's somewhat of a true story, uh, being persecuted and being put to death and boiled in water, tortured for believing in Jesus Christ. Yet they kept going, and they wanted to see God glorified. Yeah, they doubted, and, and the movie shows them struggling. But yet, they weren't ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God until salvation for all who would believe. But I think many of us are ashamed. David says, I'm not. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. I want to start by looking at a couple of words here. I'm going to go a little little geeky. Y'all ready? Stretch it out. My nerd's going to come out. I'm going to handle some Hebrew with you right now. But there's a Hebrew word here for seeking the Lord. I sought the Lord. Hebrew daras. Not that that matters to you, but this thing has got a ton of, of definitions to trying to understand it, nuances of this word. But it basically means to seek, to inquire, to consult, to try to find out. To learn information previously unknown. It also, on the other end of that term, can, conveys this idea. To allow or to permit one to seek after. So, I sought the Lord, Ross, David is saying, and what has happened? He wants to know something he hasn't known about the Lord, and the Lord is permitting him to know this about him. To come to him. But it gets even better. This word also means to give an account for, to require, to give a responsible presentation. What David is wanting to see is God to be God. To God, that would have been a really good point for an amen, because we all want that. Wake up, y'all. Come on. You did not eat turkey this morning. If I preached a sermon on Thursday and y'all were falling asleep, that's legit. But right now, wake up. Shake it out. Here we go. He wants God to be seen as superior. And it's reporting to a superior. To seek after means to come to a superior. To look for, to find out personal information is what this term means as well. To care for or to be cared for. 
to take actions which nourish and keep safe. So when you're seeking after the Lord in this area, what you're really wanting God to do is to care for you. Do you see the nuances of this word? It's not like I just looked over there and wanted to see God. No, no, no. This is an entrusting. What David is saying is I'm entrusting my life to you, Lord. I gave gave you a blank check with my life. I came to you and sat down and said, in you alone will I find respite or will I find hope? Will I find care? Will I find security? And I'm making my petition to you. I sought the Lord. This word also means to make a petition. I sought the Lord. I made a request of God to care for me. What's the verse say? He answered. I daras, and God answered. I sought the Lord. And he provided. Stated more succinctly, when we seek God, we ask the Lord in our transparency and vulnerability. We ask him within our transparency and vulnerability. We're not leaving anything out. We're coming to him truthfully for an intimate relationship with a daddy. With a father. We're asking God to care. Not to just be a king, not to just be a governor, not to be a ruler. He's all that. But this word is telling us we're coming to God and we're saying, Daddy. And just as I would care for my daughters, God does so better for us. This is what David is asking. To look to him. We look to him. The poor man, um, though, I'm sorry, verse, uh, it's, I didn't mark my verses. Those who look to him. See it, second line, and those who look to him. All right, verse five. The the phrase nabat is what we, the word nabat is Hebrew nabat, is what we get the phrase we look to him from. N-A-B-A-T is what you might be looking for. And this means to observe, to gaze, to use the perception of sight in order to understand what you're looking at. It's not just noticing that the grass is green. It's looking to understand why is it green. Why does photosynthesis work that way? Why are nutrients in the soil producing green grass when mixed with water? It's wanting to understand it. He says, I'm looking to you. Those who look to you to see you, to grasp you, to know you, to understand you, they are made radiant by looking at the Lord. Amen. Amen. Guys, this is what we exist for. To look at God makes us radiant in God. So many Christians come to God and they want something, but what they want is something stupid. They want something possessional to where we can get a car, we can get a house, or I get more money, or I get better clothes, or I get a better wife. That's actually not legit. Or I get this, or I get this, or I get this. I come to God and I want all of this stuff. And the scriptures say, no, 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 man. Just look to God. You will be radiant. You will be radiant. If you do so, we're like, yeah, no, I'm good. It's not what David's saying. Many are the afflictions of those, of the righteous. But we look to God and we're made radiant by him. It also means to have, Nabat means to have regard for. To formally think about something. Not casually. Let me give you the difference between formal and casual thinking. Casual thinking is I'm driving down the road, I see the sign for New Hope, and I pass it. Well, I'm going to need to turn around at uh, uh, whatever the next road is, Colon Road, if I've done that. But casually, you drive past the road, you look at the sign, you're like, huh, church, I should go there maybe. Oh, radio station. That's what casual thinking looks like. It's ADD. It jumps from one thing to another based upon whatever it sees, and, and then it just moves on. It doesn't stop and ponder. No, no. What David is saying is those who stop and ponder the Lord, they formally, they they make a period to say, this is where I will meditate upon the Lord. This is where I will seek after the Lord. This is where I will strive to see God. God says, they're radiant. They have life. Jesus says, I've come to give you life and life to its fullest. But the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, right? We forgot that, that's in scripture, guys. It's John 10, 10. Um, but this is the truth. We forget about it. The Christ is life. David didn't forget about that. So let me say it like this. When we look to God, 
we purposely and intensely work to understand and ponder the Lord and his attributes, his work and his self-revelation. In short, we work to know him. To look to God is to work to know God. It's not in my notes. Let me just stop for a second and ask this. How many of, of us does that describe our pursuit of the Lord? If we said, hey, do you work to know God? Is, do you look to God for the purpose of knowing God? Or do we maybe find out that we're actually looking to God for other things? That's, that's like idolatry. You can look to God for other things if God is first and we seek him most. And then when we have needs, we bring our needs to him. And if the birds of the air and the, are fed and the lilies of the field are clothed, and, won't we be taken care of by our, Lord, by our Lord? Absolutely, we will be taken care of by our Lord. So we can bring our requests for anything to God. But is your request for the things that God has created more pr- predominant of a higher ranking in your life than God himself, the creator. You guys still with me? Looks like we're sort of dazing out. We're real quick, you tracking? What we're trying to see is, is God our chief pursuit? He says, the poor man cried. The word here for cry is kara. Sort of sounds like cry, doesn't it? Kara? This is a Hebrew. Here's what it means. It does not mean to bawl. It means to call, to summon, to give a summons, to designate by name or title, to proclaim, to announce, to make a public calling out, to invite, to be invited, to read aloud and speak something. It also means to be appointed for a chosen task or imply, uh, implying high authority. It means to mention. Here's the deal. Kara is not silent. You do not kara in your head. You kara with your voice. You call out to God. It's not just crying. There's other words for weeping and mourning. This is an invitation. It's an invocation. It's asking God, it's invoking God to come down and fix what's wrong. Do you see the weight of these few verses? It's not just, oh, I got needs, but God's multiplying. I'm good. That's not what's happening here. What's happening is I have a tremendous oppressive feeling coming upon me or a situation. And instead of handling it by myself, I'm 0% involved in my situation. Now I'm 100% committed to going to God, to hunting after God. Now in the South, we hunt a little different. Sometimes we can hunt from your back porch, your window, your barn, Never your car, still illegal. Not at night, not with a light. Sounds like uh, Dr. Seuss going on here. But check this out. When you hunt, you're supposed to like dedicate yourself to that. And here's how you hunt the, the elusive big buck, or at least this is what we read about. First, you start with a shower with dirt-flavored scented soap. Or maybe apple dirt or something. Everything gets cleaned off. You're not going to use hair gels. You're going to put a deodorant on, but guess what it smells like? Dirt. Or maybe you can buy like the dough in estrus. Yes, let me put that on my armpits because that just smells wonderful. But you're going to bathe yourself in dirt, basically. Your clothes are not going to be washed by your wife. Not that that sounds sexist, but they're not going to be washed in any flowery stuff. We don't want any lavender smelling clothes. So you're going to wash it in something that smells like dirt or apples or something that is outdoor, crab apple tree, whatever. Then you're going to put your boots on. And your boots should have been like in a bag of corn. Or you spray them with a special treatment. And then you dress up. 
and you get some war paint and you paint it on your face so that the, they can't even see you. And then you get muted sunglasses so you can put them on and they can't see the whites of your eyes. Then you go sit so high in a tree that you're, you're dead certain that if a strong wind comes up, your weight's going to break that thing in half. And this deer is going to see you die, but you're not going to see, you're not going to see it die at this point. These things go through your head. And you're camoed up from head to toe, and you're sitting in this tree, and you've put this little wick in this bottle of dopey called estrus, and you let it hang and put a nice aroma of love in the area, and you try to trick this deer into coming to you so that you can say, nope, it wasn't love, it was hate. And then you put it on the wall. But you, and you get up at oh dark 30 to do this. And you stay out till it is way past dark. And then you make stupid sounds like squirrels coming down trees. Because you don't want the deer to suddenly gain intelligence and think that's a dude right over there. And you come out and you hip and hop. Look, I'm a squirrel. <laughs> and you go through the woods like this because you are dedicated to finding a stupid deer. And then we're like, Jesus, you got 10 minutes, impress me. I, I mean, I woke up, I licked my hair. That's only three day old clothes. I'll come in, I'll sit down. Did you read your Bible this week? Bible? What is that? That's legalistic. You can't tell me to read your Bible. Yet you study the outdoor manual, the North Carolina manual, page by page on what you're allowed to do or not allowed to do in hunting. But yet you won't read God's word. We turn around, we give God nothing. And we come in and we say, God, fix everything. That's not how David approached the Lord. David approached the Lord more intently than most hunters approach deer. Why are we more dedicated at getting in the presence of deer than we are in the presence of God? Now, we all had Thanksgiving yesterday, right? Every, you spend some time with your family in Thanksgiving? Raise your hand if you did. There's, there's going to be a funny question coming here. I just dimed the guys out. Now I'm going to have some fun with the girls. All right? Women, when you got together with your families, did you just haphazardly think about what to wear? Or did you pick out a special Thanksgiving outfit that you were going to wear where your boots were nice or your clothes were nice? Or did you just throw on some fat clothes? That's what I call my sweatpants. Fat clothes. Why? Because I can eat and feel fat, and the band stretches. But those clothes don't go out into public. But I couldn't wait till we got back from Thanksgiving dinner to put on my fat clothes. Anybody else with me on that one? I knew it. Why was it primarily guys' hands that went up? Women, come on. You can say I wear fat clothes and not say you're fat. That's not how, that's not how that works. You can just be like, look, I put comfy clothes on. But no one wore that to dinner yesterday or Thursday. Did anybody wear sweatpants? Did they? Okay, put your hands down. Y'all, get some class. No, I'm kidding. I'm joking. If you send me hate mail, I earned that. But <clears throat> when we cry to God, we vocally and specifically ask the Lord to fellowship with us because we've purposely been seeking after him. The way we seek our family, the way we seek out deer, fish, golf scores, whatever. Put that much effort into trying, trying to get in the presence of the Lord. And that communicates this word. And I'm going to speed up here. Because we still haven't got off the first slide. Um, there's 13 more verses to go. We fear him. Yahweh. In Hebrew. It's an adjective. Not, a, not necessarily a verb happening here. And it describes respect. To fear God is to respect God, to have a profound reverence for. See, if I have a profound reverence for something, if I think that deer is going to bust me in the woods, then I'm going to put all of this effort to not be caught by that deer. I used to do the same thing when I policed. I don't have a lot of time for this, so I'll just go quickly with this. But when you're enforcing uh, drugs and trying to uh, arrest dealers, 
You just can't roll around on the streets in your patrol car. That black and white thing sort of stands out. So you got to go either undercover or forget the covers, go under bushes. And so me and my crew would sit under bushes and call in the traffic stops after we watched the deals go by. No one even saw us. There was effort put into enforcing the laws of Georgia to making an arrest. And then I look at myself and go, do I put that same effort into seeking the Lord? There was a fear of getting hurt. I had a respect for the drug dealer to where I thought, you know what? He's probably armed. I'm not just going to come up in running shorts and a tank top. Like, hi, I'm going to take you to jail. No. I'm going to have a vest on. I'm going to have a big gun bigger than his. I'm going to have a nice push bumper on my car because sometimes I might not even want to get out of the car. Sometimes it's just easier to roll a guy over. Guys, that's a joke. It's okay to laugh in church. Except I actually did it. But that said, um, you put protective things around you because you worry. You fear, you respect the power of another individual. Do you fear and respect the power of God? David did. It's that fear, it's that respect, it's that awe, it's that reverence, it's, the, it's that profound reverence that drove David to seek the Lord the way he did. All right, so let's summarize what it means to draw near to the Lord in worship. There has to be a desire for God's presence and provision. You have to desire God. And look, I use the word provision. I know some people are going to like, Darren, don't you hate that word? Sort of. Except when it's actually a biblical use of the word. You just don't come to God and be like, God, I just want to see you. No, no. I'm coming to God to say, God, I want to see you, and I want to abide in your presence and your provision of righteousness that you impute or propitiated for me gives me the ability to abide in your presence. That's the provision I want. I want Christ's righteousness because it allows me to abide with God. So we come to God for his presence and his provision. He opens the door to us. Number two, there is an active and aggressive reorientation of our life around God. This maybe loses a lot of people. It's not passive and haphazardly. It's active and aggressive. You will to change your life to pursue the Lord. There's things we cease from so we can push towards Him. That's, that's what I mean by that. You cannot hold on to your sin and will repent towards the Lord. You can't take sin with you to Jesus. you got to let go of it. Now, the consequences of it, you can't get away from. So Jesus took those consequences of sin away from you. But He's left it up to you to say, let go of that sin. Through the power of his Holy Spirit, he gives you the ability to do so. But man, let go of that sin. That's the active, aggressive reorientation of our life. Number three, there's an actual request to know God. We want to put it before God. Like, God, I want to know you. You can say that to the Lord. I say it to him daily. Number four, there is a respectful and reverent approach to God. Something America has lost. We treat God like we're going to the beach or getting ice cream. What do you mean by that? Like, it's just, let's go get something good and have a good time. Look, he is good, and he gives, it's in, in his presence is a wonderful time. But I've never approached, well, I've never approached the president of the United States, but pick the worst president you could possibly imagine, the worst president you ever could think about. There's no way I'm approaching him without fear and reverence or respect. One, the position dictates it. He is our commander-in-chief. Number two, the secret service has a way of enforcing it. So I'm going to come to him properly. I'm not just going to be like, oh, you know what, I forgot to take my 44 off. I just come before the president. Not happening. I'm going to venture to say you're probably not going to get in front of him with the toothpick that comes off of a Swiss Army knife that may be considered a weapon. And we're like, okay, you, you treat an airplane, we treat, not you, I'm saying we, America, treats an airplane with more respect than we do God. 
we, ungo, we let go of all of our things not, not allowed or prohibited to get onto an airplane voluntarily. In fact, if you've ever watched a knife be donated to the airlines from your hands, that you know you're not getting that back, that's not making its trip to Dallas with you. He just pocketed that thing or it went into a fire or something. You know, I'm not taking another knife with me. So you plan ahead on how to approach Delta or American Airlines. Do we put that same thought into approaching God? Do we plan ahead of how to approach the Lord? This is one thing I've been thinking about with preaching. It challenges. The fact I constantly preach and proclaim the gospel to people challenges me to sit there and say, what do I do in my spare time? Because I want to live a consistent life. I don't want to have to say, well, look, Lord, I'm about to share the gospel with somebody, but i got to lay all these sins down because I didn't think about that beforehand. Now i got all this dirt in my life, rebellion, because I lived how I wanted, but now, God, just fix it so I can do what you want me to do. There was an attitude in, in me for, for a while with that. It's where I was like, okay, what happens Monday through, through Friday is one thing, but then on Sunday I need to be a different person. That's not legit. It doesn't honor the Lord. We want to be consistent. We want to respectfully come before the Lord all the time. All right, I got to go faster. I'll finish like this. Check this out. Does God reward this? I just put this out there. Does God reward it? Absolutely he does. Listen, does God reward my efforts in seeking him? Yes, absolutely he does. It is not even up for debate. If you seek the Lord, you will find him. God, I got to go fast with this, but verse 4, God answers David. Verse 4, God delivers David. Verse 5, God gives vitality to David. Verse 5, God exalts David. Doesn't allow him to be shamed, right? Verse 6, God rescues David from trouble. Verse 7, God dwells with David. David lists six different ways God blessed his four types of pursuits of him or his four approaches. He sought him. He called out to him, cried out to him. He looked to him, and he feared him. Those were David's four approaches. God says, okay, I'm going to answer you. I'm going to hear you, answer you. I'm going to deliver you. I'm going to give you vitality. I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to rescue you, and I'm going to abide with you. So does the scripture reward David for seeking God? Will we be rewarded by God for seeking God? Absolutely. Which therefore brings us to the invitation to fellowship with God. David understands this, and so in verses 8 to 14, he says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Does that sound like that's optional? You might be blessed, you could be blessed. No, no, no. Absolutely blessed is the man who takes refuge, or woman, who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The long, young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O oh children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear the Lord. What man is there who desires life and wants to live many days that he may see his good? Keep your tongue from evil then and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The invitation is fourfold. Come experience the Lord. Verse 8, I'll go slow for this. You might want to write this down. Here's what we're invited into, okay? This becomes the test, the metric of your life. Are you seeking God the way God tells us to seek him? Here's the fourfold response to it. Come experience the Lord. Taste and see. That's experiential, is it not? You can't taste something without experiencing it. So taste and see. The Lord is good. Number two, come hide in the Lord. Take refuge in him. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in God. We're going to come and experience God. We're going to come and hide in God. Next, we're going to come and honor the Lord. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. What are we going to do? We're going to come to experience. We're going to come to hide. We're going to come to fear or honor God. Number four, we're going to come and find blessings from the Lord. That is what the rest of the verses talk about. 
That's the deal with the young lions and the call to come listen. What is David saying? If you will come to God for blessings, you will find blessings in God. What's the reverse of that? If you go anywhere else for blessings, it's not a guarantee you're going to find blessings. So let me ask you, is this your approach? Is this what is happening? The desired response can be understood in three ways. I just said these four things. What is the passage telling us to do? It's telling us to respond in three ways. Listen, number one, listen to those who walk with God and learn their ways. It's a call to discipleship. The first call, what David is saying is, come listen to me. Let me tell you what I've experienced about the Lord. I'm going to impart my experience to you so you can see who God is. And now that's how you can seek God and find that same experience in your life. Does this make sense? It's an invitation to a community, not to isolation. Too many Christians think, I can be a Christian by myself. The scripture hotly debates you on that one. No, it's an invitation to a community to learn. Being born again means exactly that. Born again. Throw a baby, brand new, out on the lawn. It dies in a couple of days. We have a word for that. It's called aborting. Become a Christian and just go walk off and do your own thing is to abort life in Christ and do it your own way. Scripture argues against that. Discipleship is what God calls us to. Number two. Avoid speaking lies and about that which is evil. Wait, what? All right, let me explain this. This is verse 13. What do you mean by avoid speaking lies? How does avoid speaking lie, lies and about evil things have anything to do with my act of repentance or seeking the Lord? Well, the lie I'm talking about is not a, a stupid lie. Well, all lies are stupid, but a stupid lie would be something like, no, I didn't take that when you took it. That's not what he's calling you to. He's not talking about, hey, uh, don't lie on your taxes anymore. That's not the level of repentance here. You should do that. You should not lie on your taxes. You should be truthful. But the lying he's talking about is this lie. I can find good things outside of God. Stop that lie. That lie has to come to an end. If you're going to seek the Lord, you got to stop seeking other things, which means you got to stop telling yourself there's a better life away from God's way or apart from God's way. This is huge. Number one, come to a community and learn from someone else. Number two, stop speaking lies about where you think your hope and your happiness and your life is to be found. Number three, turn from sin. And two, that which is righteous, the Lord. David gives a testimony of saying, I was in severe need, but I sought the Lord. And he blessed me. Come and do the same with me. And we would say, how? And he would say, listen to me. Worship, listen and worship with me. Number two, stop believing Satan's lies. He's the accuser. He's the liar. He comes to deceive us. Instead, know that God is where the source of life is. And then number three, actually go to God. That's what the psalm calls us to. So let me end with that. There's more that I could add to it. It's basically a redundant because the, verse, the passage says the same thing all over again in just a different way. It's great. But let me just add this. How have you repented to the Lord? Is what I just described to you your Christianity? Or is your version different? Is my version different? See, little testimony here. I came to know Jesus at 18 years old, almost 19 years old. I'd grown up in church. I didn't like what I saw. I wanted no part of the church, none whatsoever. But the Lord got my attention, called out to me, and I had to take a knee before him. And so I cried out for salvation and life in him. And then I told him, yeah, I'll serve you, but not in a church. So I'll go to Bible college. I'll get a degree. I'll go to seminary. I'll go get a doctorate. And my whole goal is, Jesus, I want to teach in a seminary or write books, but I don't actually want to be in the church. I don't want any part of the church. And so this message is very relevant to me 
because I saw the church hurt a lot of people. I've been hurt by the church myself. I'm sure some of you have as well. And I can tell you this, now that I do what I do, I've hurt some people as a pastor. And you've hurt some people as a congregation. One truthful person. Uh, oh, we can all say, oh my, together. Oh my. Okay, this side's really, you guys are doing good today. Y'all, you hurt my heart. <laughs> but check this out. I didn't want anything to do with the church. And the Lord got my attention and wooed me back in. You know what he did? He put a man in my life named Phil Carpenter. And Phil Carpenter took me under, he was my pastor, he took me under his wings. And he said, hey, Darren, what I want you to do, I want you to come and volunteer with me one day a week. Every day I want that day from you. I know you're a cop, I know you're doing what you're doing. Come and give me every, every day that you have off. So I worked a rotational shift, and so it was different every week. But I'm coming and giving that day. He's like, okay, we're going to sit, we're going to read, we're going to pray. We're going to listen to Southern Gospel. <sighs> I learned to like it over time. But it was hard at first, but he loved it, and I just listened to words, and then darn it, if I can't go down the road and sing just about every Southern Gospel song out there today and know what they're singing, but anyways, and we would go through the Psalms, and we would read, and he'd see something on my face, he's like, read this Psalm out to me, and I chauffeured him from ministry location to ministry location for a year, and then he said, now you do it, and he never took his hands off of me. He just kept pulling me in. And what I saw was the love of Christ through a single person who said, I'm going to look at you and I'm going to take ownership of you. I want you to walk with the Lord. And I'm going to let you see my walk with the Lord. We're just going to talk about Jesus and what he does. And man, I love that. It's what I do here. It's what I want you to see. I hate event-based worship. It doesn't do anything for me. It's not necessarily supposed to. It's supposed to be us praising God. So let me go back on that. I hate only event-based worship. We have to have this. This is where we praise God as a unit, as a body together. But we also have to disciple each other, and that's not where this takes place. And so I couldn't see the good of church for years. I wanted nothing to do with it. I wanted to be my own Christian. Us four and no more. Literally, there's four in my family. Us four and no more. Pfft, build the walls up. We can worship Jesus at the altar in my home. And that was the idea. And the Lord was like, yeah, yeah, Darren, I got one problem with that. You're stupid. So let me fix that. And he kept bringing me back from that. And what I've seen over the past 10 years of being in the church serving in leadership in the church is this the more I work to enjoy other people as they enjoy the Lord the more I get to enjoy the Lord the more I work to help other people enjoy the Lord the more I enjoy the Lord the more I work to help other people enjoy the Lord the more they enjoy the Lord therefore God must enjoy this because he's blessing it so my Christianity had to change from what I had been taught which is Come, sing, <laughs> preach for 25 minutes. Y'all know that never happens. And then go home. That's what I had been taught. I had to go. The call was to come and be the church. Be the bride of Christ. I'm going out on a limb here, but I think my bride enjoys me. Thank you. Whew, you waited there for... <laughs> Just a little too long there. I was like, oh man, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> I think somebody else, no. <laughs> my bride enjoys me. And I enjoy my bride. Two questions. Do you enjoy Christ? Does Christ enjoy you? You're his bride. We are his bride. Do you enjoy Christ? Does Christ enjoy you? Now, whatever you need to do, do it before the Lord. I'm going to dismiss us in prayer. If you need to come talk to me, I'm here. If you need to talk to any of our elders, we're here. If you need to grab the person next to you and say, I need help enjoying the Lord, let me just be honest here for a second, okay? I can't disciple every single person in here. I can't walk with 300 people. I can only walk with a dozen or so, half a dozen. But there are many other people in here who can walk with other people. My charge to you 
would be get your heart right before Christ by saying, Jesus, I've been off the path a little bit. I want to get back on to loving you. And then ask him this. Open my eyes. Let me see somebody that I can enjoy you with. Where we sharpen each other. As iron sharpens iron, one person sharpens another. Where we can help each other walk with the Lord. That's my invitation for you to pray to the Lord right now and ask him. Thank you for this amount of time on a Sunday following Thanksgiving. If you're a visitor with us, um, this happens every week. So <laughs> welcome for you to come back. Um, if you've been here with us a long time, just oh my is fine. But here we go. Lord, we love you. God, we thank you for your presence in our life. Jesus, I ask through your Holy Spirit at the will of the Father that you would reveal to us where we have gone awry where we have gone off the path. Call us back to you. Let us walk with you. Worship you in spirit and in truth. I thank you for these people, these wonderful brothers and sisters I have in Christ in this room right now, and those who will not, uh, or are not here, but will come to be brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I ask that you would help us to encourage one another, to spur one another on. Allow us to find a friend like David had with Jonathan that kept each other in check to walk with you. Allow us to be a Paul and Barnabas or a Paul and Timothy and Silas and Titus and everyone else. Father, let us not walk as individuals anymore, but rather, let us walk in unity adorning ourselves with good works and love for the day where we see you face to face. Jesus, I thank you for saving us. If there is one in here who does not know you, has not walked with you, has not asked you to save them and give them life, I ask that they would do so now, just by simply saying, Jesus, forgive me and give me that life that you promised. Lord, I ask that you'd give that person the boldness to then tell somebody else about it. For those of us in here who aren't fully obedient to you, I don't think any of us are fully obedient, but those of us who may be growing weak in our obedience, Lord, we ask that you would strengthen them and give them the boldness to ask for help. To cry out to somebody and say, help my faith, help my unbelief. God, I thank you for what you're doing in our church, your church, but to where we are walking with each other. It pains me for the slow growth of the discipleship groups in the church. But Lord, we just ask that you would multiply, radically multiply the disciples in this church so that no one lives on an island. Unite us to you, Lord. I could keep going on, but Jesus, we love you. We just celebrated Thanksgiving. Let us be thankful for you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And you have sealed us in your hand by the promise of the Holy Spirit, purchased by your death on the cross, proven by your resurrection, and all of this was at the will of the Father. Lord, we love you. It's through your holy name we pray. Amen. Love you guys.